Welcome, Xiaofeng. Um, China is emerging from COVID, and tell us what has happened to the asset management industry in the country, and what Amundi has been focusing on for the past three years. Yeah, maybe not only the last three years. Uh, the last three years, uh, clearly, a years associated with COVID and COVID-led uh, disruptions. But before uh, 2019, uh, basically, in 2017, 2018, uh, China has started the restructuring of the asset management business. Uh, after an initial period of fast growth or even wild growth uh, in the sector. So basically in 2018, uh, in, uh, in April, uh, the government has issued the uh, asset management regulation. Uh, this regulation has uh, kick-started um, the restructuring uh, has rent in the shadow banking activities, such as uh, non-standard products, channel business. So that has started already in 2018. And then uh, in 2019, in July, uh, the state uh, uh, financial stability and development commission uh, has issued the 11 measures uh, in favor of the deepening of the open up policy. And this has led to the wave of creation of uh, you know, foreign majority owned JV, uh, wholly foreign owned FMC. Uh, so if you look at the past five years, including three years under the shade of COVID, China has basically uh, witnessed a deep and broad restructuring uh, uh, phase. Uh, and uh, clearly associated with uh, opening up uh, policy so as to attract more foreign capital. And at the meantime, uh, we have already seen in 2018, the combination of the insurance regulator and the banking regulator to uh, create CBIRC, China Banking and Insurance Regulatory Commission. And not long ago, this has been upgraded to a national financial regulatory administration. So if you put all these things together, uh, basically you have the sentiment that uh, the last five years, including three years of COVID, it's kind of watershed moment in the industrial uh, uh, evolution. Absolutely. So we did see this very wild period of growth before the regulatory overhauls. But at the same time, with the regulatory overhauls, there has been progress. The wholly owned units, as you mentioned, is one of them. Um, for Mundi itself, you've been taking a multi-pronged approach to attacking this market, trying to expand in China, including the JVs with Bank of China, Agriculture Bank, um, what is the latest with these different divisions? And how is Amundi planning your next steps? Yeah, we have uh, right now two JVs, uh, one with Agriculture Bank of China. So it was established 15 years ago. Uh, so this is in the FMC uh, category, fund management category, supervised by the market regulator, CSRC. And then we have another JV, created in 2020 with Bank of China in the WMC category, wealth management uh, company. Uh, and in the last three years, uh, our uh, FMCJV uh, has uh, uh, basically witnessed the transformation of the model. Uh, as I, I explained uh, uh, earlier, uh, after a rapid growth uh, in uh, you know, 2015, picking at 2015, uh, the JV has uh, basically transformed itself into a, uh, uh, a company relying more uh, on mutual funds rather than on uh, the, the products uh, distributed through the subsidiary. Uh, our, our JV with uh, BOC 
has been developing very fast in 2020, end of 2020 and 2021, uh, and, and leveraging the very good dynamics there. And in 2022, uh, uh, the, the, the JV has weathered uh, very challenging uh, conditions. Uh, and, and, and this is why uh, within three years of existence, the JV has already got the, 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 the tailwinds for the development, but also got headwinds. I think with that, the JV has acquired a very solid resilience uh, for the future. And when we look at the numbers uh, in Q1 or early Q2, uh, things are, are very significantly improving. You know, last time we talked, um, you mentioned how you wanted to build Greater China as a secondary home base for Amundi, um, also doubling assets in the region. Where is Amundi when it comes to those goals? And what does that mean for your longer term strategy in China? I think overall, uh, our objective for, for Asia remains unchanged uh, and also is on track. Uh, and obviously, uh, with all the investments uh, we have made and which will be made uh, further, uh, we, we are doing all we can to contribute more uh, uh, to the Asian growth of Amundi, uh, especially again through uh, the Chinese uh, entities. Uh, and as I mentioned already, uh, um, uh, right now, uh, we are exiting uh, this period of restructuring. Uh, we are now on a more uh, sustainable ground. Uh, and the regulatory environment has improved very significantly. So we're entering now a new era uh, with a more long-term and more sustainable uh, uh, growth. Basically, when you look at the two key segments I commented on earlier, FMC, WNC, basically each segment has roughly 26 trillion German B in AUM, more or less equal. And combined, they represent 40% of the overall Chinese AUM, roughly 130 uh, a trillion. Uh, combined, roughly 54. And basically, they're going to grow further, especially, I think, the WNC. Uh, will also continue the growth because the, the story is very short. Uh, the products of issued by WMC in the past was carrying an implicit guarantee. Now the products are all NAV based, mark to market based. And actually, uh, when you look at the number of investors uh, in the uh, WMC product, the number is very limited for the whole China you have less than 100 million investors in the WMC segment. And 95% of them are uh, retail investors. So this is a very interesting segment offering deposit substitute uh, products to bank clients. And again, uh, when you look at the situation in China right now, uh, uh, the households still have more than 50% of their wealth in cash and deposit. With, a, with a, the, the GDP per head exceeding $10,000, we're going to see uh, the acceleration of uh, uh, inflow into financial products. We're going to see more important reallocation uh, uh, to financial products. And another very important uh, pillar in support of the growth of the industry is the, the pension business. We expect pension also to be a very important source of assets going forward in the Chinese industry. So let's talk about pension. Um, as of now, global asset managers are making some progress in this space very slowly. Um, it is a very preliminary stage of development. What would you like to see more in terms of regulatory support and also in the industry in order for global asset managers to commit more to the space? I think pension is part of the uh, uh, social security net effort. Uh, and it's key, 
but also sensitive because of the social implication. Uh, so the regulators and the government want to make sure that they are doing right things. So this is why you have got typical pilot program to test ground. The pilot uh, programs typically are limited in a number of pilot cities with a uh, certain con uh, a quota. So this is why uh, it, it will continue. Uh, it would try to get experience in, in serving, in meeting the need of the uh, uh, savers for the uh, pension and retirement uh, um, objective. Uh, and it's clear that in a country like China, with 1.4 billion people, authorities are quite cautious when it comes to this kind of sensitive social topic. But uh, the, the, I think the roadmap is there. Upon completion of the pirate programs, there will be new regulations out to expand uh, the, the program. So uh, uh, in, in China, you don't dream about making huge money overnight. But clearly, if you uh, bear in mind the objective of deep cultivation in the market, you work on the brand, on the talent, you work on the plan to upgrade your on-the-ground capability, and then you will harvest all the investment you, 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 you have made and you'll be making. No, not all the asset managers have uh, managed to stick to their long-term goals. So for you, as your at largest asset manager, when you are communicating with headquarters and when you're thinking about how you place your resources in this greater region, greater China region, long-term wise, um, what, are, what goes into the thought process and how do you communicate those messages? Yeah, I think this is, a, again, a very good question because, uh, you know, China has uh, embarked on the uh, reform and opening four decades ago. Uh, and we, we're always saying that it's a long-term investment, long-term journey. Uh, I think as a, a corporate executive, uh, we have also to bear in mind the, uh, you know, the profitability uh, of the uh, investment. Uh, we have to uh, do an in-depth feasibility study so as to um, combine short-term and long-term, you know, uh, to improve the overall credibility of our projects. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, thinking long-term is definitely key for the image, for the brand, but at the same time, in order to be sustainable, you have to combine both short-term and long-term. It's about credibility. And this is why uh, we are very determined in pursuing all the development options in China. Uh, but it's very important for us also to uh, do it right for our two JVs, do it right for our private placement entity in Beijing QDLP, and at the same time, uh, we look at all the other options uh, which could boost uh, our, our growth. And also, we believe that Chinese uh, asset management market will become a huge market on its own. The market will, it will be like the North American market, will be like the European market, with a very specific and strong regulatory framework. So uh, uh, it's important that we elevate uh, the, the setup, elevate the seniority, the commitment, and the technicity uh, of the setup. By doing that, over, you know, over the time, we can capture the opportunities. So really making sure that the commitment is long-term and managing the expectations of profitability versus the longer-term growth. Um, with uh, the U.S. and China tensions, how, how are you as a European asset manager positioning yourself? I think with the uh, tension, geopolitical tension, 
uh, and we see already that China uh, uh, is uh, implementing a strategy uh, named double circulation, international circulation that has been on for decades, and also uh, domestic circulation, uh, uh, betting on domestic consumption. I think with the geopolitical tensions, uh, clearly we will see more and more domestic circulation. So meaning that uh, China will, will, will beef up and strengthen uh, the, 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 the resilience of the market amid a uh, changing uh, uh, you know, geopolitical uh, environment. And, and this is why for this reason, as I mentioned earlier, and it's key for global asset managers uh, to get into this market with a setup that is a seniorized, with a stronger technicity, uh, with stronger autonomy, so as to stay there and capture the opportunities. Uh, now, I mean, we have been operating in China since 1982, uh, so more than four decades. Uh, and uh, I mean, we have already seen uh, many challenges of different nature. Uh, and I think uh, we have also acquired um, experience in dealing with different uh, challenging situations. Uh, so uh, I'm confident that uh, uh, with that in mind, uh, we will also continue to navigate uh, the, the new situation uh, in a sustainable uh, way. Um, in general, I mean, uh, the, the worst is not always certain in the future. And Amundi once mentioned that the goal for 2025 out of Asia is to double the assets to 500 billion euros. What are the growth drivers in this region apart from greater China? I think uh, uh, a pension business uh, in the region, uh, partnership approach. Uh, you know, we, uh, we're European. So uh, European is very capable of finding a compromise. Uh, otherwise, Europe would not have achieved the integration of EU. Uh, so we, we bet on partnership. We need partners, we need banking partners, we need our uh, uh, clients and partners. So uh, the approach is again a partnership approach, uh, external uh, growth opportunities, uh, and also uh, our capability in advising our clients on investment solutions, but also on specific uh, transformation process. Uh, so pension uh, is one of the key segments, uh, institutional business uh, is a key uh, segment, but at the same time, retail business uh, will be a very important driver for the world. Which countries are you looking at specifically for these pension opportunities? I think uh, I mentioned already mainland, I mean in Hong Kong as well, uh, and uh, in the Taiwanese market, the same. And when you look at elsewhere in Asia, we do see a lot of opportunities uh, uh, with the pension uh, uh, business. I see. Um, what have you seen in terms of client or customer um, appetite change when it comes to investing? You mentioned the wealth management business, the, um, the CSRC overseeing fund management business. To many outsiders, it almost looks the same, but you on the ground looking at the appetite of investors, um, are, what are the differences and how do you adjust your, your strategy to cater? Well, if I focus on China, uh, I would say that uh, clients who are used to products carrying a guarantee these days uh, try to uh, invest in products that beat the deposit rate. Uh, they may not like volatility uh, in the mutual fund market, uh, and then they try to, uh, you know, allocate more money into products that are beating the deposit rate. Uh, so typically in China, uh, we see fixed income plus 
uh, mostly fixed income with a pocket allocated to, to, to equity so as to enhance the return. And second, uh, we also uh, see the pickup of interest in the ESG theme, like renewable energies, climate change, net zero, this kind of thematic uh, funds in support of the transition, energy transition. Uh, and, and this is also a very uh, um, uh, important uh, uh, strategy. And as well, uh, they look at what we call balance fund in the mutual, uh, in the mutual fund markets, uh, allocating uh, partly to bonds and partly to, to, to uh, uh, equity. Mm. Well, Safo, that's all the time we have for our panel. Thank you very much. Thank you.